Why are we here? Well, we are an immortal, limitless, indirect fractal of God. So the only thing that an immortal, perfect, divine, limitless, indirect fractal of God wants is experience. It wants this experience, that experience, human experience, alien experience, 21st century experience, 38th century experience. And by the way, they're all happening right now. So it just wants experience, right? And through the experiences, it learns and evolves. And what it learns and evolves is about itself, this unlimited, divine, indirect fractal of God. Hello, and welcome to Passion Harvest. I am Louisa, your host. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our guest is R.J. Spinner. He healed himself from permanent paralysis. R.J. Spinner teaches that all your unrealized potential, ill health, and limited personal success will undergo complete transformation through the same process he used to heal himself of permanent chest down paralysis and severe chronic illness. His self-realization technique has already completely changed and saved the lives of many across the globe. RJ Spinner is the author of Supercharged Self-Healing. This is his story and this is his passion. RJ Spinner, welcome to Passion Harvest. Thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure. I've got so many questions to ask you, but perhaps for those of the audience that don't know anything about you, would you mind sharing a little bit about your incredible story and your incredible journey from paralysis and chronic illness to health? April 23rd, 2016, I became, uh, air quotes, uh, permanently paralyzed from the chest down. Uh, I was told I'd only live another 48 hours. I was diagnosed with multiple, multiple diseases from Hashimoto's severe uh, autoimmune disease, uh, type one diabetes, pancreatitis, thyroiditis, and something called autonomic dysreflexia, which um, can be lethal for paraplegics and quadriplegics. Um, the body, the autonomic system, which regulates your heartbeat, your breathing, your your pulse. Uh, this just goes haywire. It, it, it's no longer it's no longer automatically regulated. Um, so all those things uh, were occurring all at the same time, and I had a, what's uh, I had an emergency life saving surgery, and the type of surgery is called a laminectomy, and it's where they literally scrape off the infection off of your spine. Uh, <clears throat> and there's a video of this; people can see it. Uh, there's the surgeon's notes. Um, I filmed myself unparalyzing myself because believe it or not in the ICU, uh, when I woke up from emergency life-saving surgery, the best way to say it is that I had, a, I had fully awakened into authentic cosmic consciousness. And, uh, I remembered, and that's the word that I use. I remembered how healing works. Like I used to say as a kid, if I get sick, I'll just heal myself. But it's kind of like that veil of forgetting had been removed. And it's like all the all the know-how, if you will, was was right back in my hands. And in the ICU, I literally started explaining that I would put myself back together. I'm going to walk. I'm going to heal myself. And in exactly 100 days, I'm going to walk unassisted. And as I said, I went ahead and had the nurses, the physical therapists, everyone film this process because they knew no one would believe that this was actually going to happen. And the, the one guest that I had uh, while I was in the hospital rehab <clears throat> for about, uh, about two, about two months, give or take, um, was a Chinese medicine expert. And so he was the only one that was seeing me. He was my only guest and he was witnessing and participating in this uh, healing, this extraordinary, impossible, which it's not, this extraordinary, impossible healing. And uh, he's the gentleman who wound up uh, writing the forward for the book because he he wanted to be able to capture also from his perspective what was really going on. Because as he says in the forward, if he didn't witness it firsthand, he would have said, this is this is impossible. This level of healing is, is not possible. And it's certainly not possible in 100 days, like the exact day that this guy predicted. So uh, that's... <laughs> Uh, if I made a, a a long story longer, I apologize, but uh, it is a it is a knowingness. It's a it's a different sort of level of understanding of things of the self 
that we can relate to self-realization or enlightenment. Self-healing and self-realization are not the same thing, but they're interconnected. And really since that day, I was able to walk unassisted in a hundred days. Um, I wrote a, a book as you're well aware of. And I've since, since then, even as soon as I got out of the hospital rehab, I've been teaching people through the Chinese medicine expert who would bring me to his, uh, his clinic. I've been teaching meditation, metaphysics, uh, the mechanics of self-healing and self-realization really since then. And so that kind of brings us to today. <laughs> so a big congratulations um, for those of the audience that haven't read your book, Supercharged Self-Healing. How did you do it? I know you have a seven step process. How, how did you do it? Right. That, that's right. That's the question, right? How did you do that? <laughs> so, um, the, the Louisa, the shortest answer is the way that I describe it is it's it's the deconstruction of the false self. Okay, now when I say that without me going on and on, and anyone who knows me, I end up going on and on and on. I'll try not to. So the deconstruction of the false self, this is what we call the ego or the egoic mind or the, the human character or what I have renamed, which is hopefully uh, more accurate, uh, the ego mind identity. So it's the false self that we think we are, how we feel about ourselves and therefore interrelate with the world. It's really all the things that we've accumulated and identified with since our trip to earth. Now, every thought that we have is in context to something we've identified ourselves with since we got here. So in that sense, none of those things are actually you. So it is the peeling away, if you want to think of an onion, peeling away, peeling away, peeling away till you get to actually what you really are. And you can call that self-realization if, if you want or whatever words you want to use. But it was the tangible experience of having no identification and being able to work with myself at the very core of what I really am. And from there, we're able to do, and that's what I outlined in the book, I found, I found myself doing these seven things over and over and over again. And I really didn't stop until I was healed, until I could walk, uh, as I predicted, 100 days from there. So the, that's the long answer. The short answer is the deconstruction of the false self or the removal or disintegration of the ego mind identity or what we call the egoic mind. I understand what you're saying, but it sounds incredibly hard in our humanness to even attempt that. I, I would say, it, yeah, from the out, maybe from the outside looking in, that sounds um, impossible, extraordinarily difficult. I, I, I'm here to tell you it's the, actually the opposite. So in actuality, believe it or not, uh, enlightenment is the easiest thing in the world because it's the only thing here and now. And so I had this experience, and, it, and believe it or not, even what goes beyond enlightenment, I, I had this experience when I woke up from emergency life-saving surgery. And it became sort of this effortless effort to simply just maneuver, manipulate, command higher frequency energy and bring it into uh, my, my subtle bodies of energy and then my physical body. But once the thinking mind is just silenced, there's nothing to do but the creation. There is no doubt. There is no wonder. How does this work? I don't think it's really going to happen. Except it, it literally was not occurring. There was no thought process whatsoever. It was a knowingness, and I simply just followed my own higher intuitive functionality, which flows on the river of intuition, which is what we call wisdom. So I just simply followed exactly what it is that I that I knew that I needed to do. It's quite effortless. And for those that are looking to heal themselves, whether it's mental, emotional, physical, or all the above, all of those um, issues belong to the false character. And so when you begin to remove the false character, the issues that belong to the false character leave as well. So it, it's, the, it's the paradigm shift of not treating the body. It's actually removing the egoic mind. And then along with that, its story of disharmony goes with it. I'm just thinking, I mean, me included, but all those stories we tell ourselves, the egoic mind you know the worries the fears the doubts the unworthiness it causes so many problems and it it, it seems so real it, it, it's it sure does uh but being present 
and not thinking is our natural state. And it just takes a little practice. We, we've gotten very, we've gotten out of alignment. So in other words, the egoic mind for, you know, for most of us, just sort of a nonstop freight train, thinking, 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 right? Well, <clears throat> by just practicing, which is what I put in the beginning of the book, is I talk about the ego mind identity and what I call magic tricks uh, to overcome the spell of the ego mind identity. And these magic tricks literally work in one second. So people now can meditate in one single second. And then all you do is maintain that presence that beingness and take your beingness and put it into your doing this. Now the ego of mind has no place in any of that. And it's, it's the simple command of energy. Most of our energy is in our lower astral and all mental and our mental body, which is why we don't stop thinking. Well, if you just let that energy drop down, just like water draining from a bathtub and let that energy return to where it sits within our physical body, which is just beneath the belly button above the groin. Your mind instantly becomes clear. There's no emotions roiling. Now you're simply present. Now, as you notice, this doesn't require an effort. So how difficult can it really be to do something that doesn't require any effort? So that's really the, the starting point. And from there, the, the book and the, the courses and all these other things teach you how to command the energy that you've been using for doubt and emotions to command that energy and harness it properly with the single pointedness of focus and channel that energy to exactly where you need it to go within your physical body. And then on top of that, learning to command higher frequency energy, which is by opening your crown chakra and allowing that energy to come in like a waterfall. And as soon as people start doing that, it's tangible. You can feel the electric charge going through you. And that's the tangible um, realization that you, that you actually are healing yourself. And so once you learn how to command the energy and the, and the egoic mind is not uh, running roughshod, I mean, your, your ego will gladly destroy your life just to be right. So we have, to, we have to reclaim our sovereignty. And how we do that is by controlling our energy. We use our energy for everything. So if you want to lead the most successful life, it only stands to reason that you have to have control of your energy since we use energy for everything. And the book will teach you step by step on how, and we just did one little magic trick about just dropping the energy down. It's it's this simple. I'm not going to say it's that easy because we've been out of balance for a while, but it is this simple and it's a repeatable process that, that anyone can do. Just to clarify, it's not what you just said, but it's not only for healing. It can be for all aspects of our life. Yeah, this, yeah, this is what, um, yes, absolutely. So uh, many people that I work with uh, they come to me for healing, whether it's mental, emotional, physical, but some people don't come to me for that at all. What they come to me for is they're trying to lead a better quality of life and they just can't seem to align themselves with themselves properly, whether it's um, self-control or self-discipline. By working with your energy and learning to harness your energy and using single pointedness of focus, people are realizing that the, the achievements that they can experience in this life are truly unlimited because when you're working with yourself directly, the unlimited self, the I am, if people are familiar with the I am, the I am is unlimited. It's, a, it's an indirect fractal of God. It has no limitations. We build parameters and limitations through the egoic mind. So once we've learned to command the energy and not let the energy go into the egoic mind, we're able to use our, our imagination and higher mind and align ourself and our energy with that. And with that comes achievement and manifestation of goals. Humans suffer. I mean, perhaps suffering is a choice. We suffer so incredibly. Why do we have the ego? It's just a term and a name that we can relate to, but why? The the, the ego, or what I call the ego mind identity, uh, it, it's created through incarnation. So in our, in our natural state and in our natural environment, we are not incarnate. We would, what we term disincarnate. We are an energy being. We're having a temporary physical experience and the physical experience we're having has to do with the suit that we wear, whether human or alien. So the ego mind identity is created through the incarnation as you are descending dimensionally and frequentially. Essentially, you're losing connection to what you really are and where you come from. 
And for most of us, by the time that we get here, our connection, our disconnection is complete. We no longer know who we are, where we come from, what we're doing here, what the point is, how to operate properly. So instead of reaching within and sort of rekindling that connection to our own higher mind and our higher self, we do the opposite. We create a false character based upon identification with the suit and then everything else that we that we tend to agree with or we allow ourselves to agree with. So the, the ego mind identity is created through incarnation. The interesting thing is that at least from my perspective, the interesting thing is, is that it's absolutely necessary uh, having, a, having an ego, having an ego mind identity. And, and I'll explain. So the, the ego or the ego mind identity is like the glue that keeps what you really are here. So you can never ever, and I've tried twice, uh, maybe I'll get into that. So you can never completely annihilate or remove the ego mind identity because when you do you can't stay here you literally eject out of your body and i've done this repeatedly and i'm like okay i guess i'll just stop because there's no point in this so we all have to have the ego mind identity okay the key is is to not let it make any decisions in your life so here's here's the analogy right so you get in your car we want to be the driver of our incarnation, our true self, right? Our soul, our consciousness, our sentience, our love, our I am, however you want to say that. We want that to lead the incarnation because that's really what we are. So imagine driving your car right now. We know now that the ego or the ego mind identity must remain with us because it's the glue that keeps us temporarily merged with the physical form. So how I view it or talk about it is that it's kind of like picking somebody up for the ride because the ego mind is going to be with you the whole incarnation. But you tell them to get in the back seat, keep your hands to yourself. And I don't want to hear a peep. I'm driving. Okay. Now it's just an, it's just an analogy, but yeah, I love that. <laughs> it, yeah. It's effective. And, and that way you're being true to yourself and you're not just doing a poor imitation of mimicry based upon whatever it is that you've agreed to align yourself with here. You can truly be yourself, but you can only have free will and truly be yourself when the ego mind identity is in the back seat, not reaching for the wheel and not yammering about what to do. I can absolutely relate with that, but gosh, that person in the back seat continues talking a lot. <laughs> so what is our true self? That's a great question. Okay. For, from my tangible experience, what, what we are, okay, we've used the word soul. That's That's been used for, I, for I who knows how long. Okay. Uh, I found there's a little more accurate ways to understand what we really are. So what we really are is what I call sentience. Now, sentience is a divine intelligence. That's the indirect fractal of God. And I say indirect because we're a projection of our higher self. Okay. So this divine intelligence really is our level or, or amount, or believe it or not, weight of our love and wisdom. And the subsets of that are talents and abilities. Now, we, what we are at our core is exactly that. This is sentience, a divine intelligence. That's what we are. Now, this sentience or divine intelligence is given energy to create. Now, this energy we use for everything, as we talked about earlier. We use energy to think, to emote, to animate the body, as I talk with my hands, to even to create an incarnation requires energy, right? Okay. But we are the sentience given energy. Now, those two things locked together have been what we have called the soul. Uh, I don't think it's, I don't feel that it's completely accurate from my direct tangible experience. We are this divine intelligence that uses energy to constantly create. That's that's what we really are. Just like we are not what we create, the painter is not the painting. And so it's important not to lose yourself in your creation, such as the ego mind identity and the incarnation itself. And this way you can stay true to what you really are and operate in a high frequency way and create the life that you truly desire that's reflective of your own love and wisdom and talents and abilities. You explain that so beautifully. Thank you. So <laughs> I'm asking hard questions in your opinion. Well, this shows about you today, but why? What is the point? What is the purpose of it all? Why are we here? Another big question. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so uh, there's many ways that I've explained this. I'll, I'll, I'll explain it this way today, right? Okay. What we are 
most people, even scientists today, talk about that energy cannot be created or destroyed, right? It just is. It just changes form. Okay, there's a lot of truth in that. That's not the whole picture, but there's a lot of truth in that. So what I'm saying is what we really are is immortal. Okay, there's no such thing as death. Physical death is astral rebirth and astral death is physical rebirth. The key is to transcend that cyclical nature through the identification with those temporary forms. And when that happens, self-realization or actually self-mastery is really what starts to happen. Okay, so why are we here? Well, we are an immortal, limitless, indirect fractal of God. So the only thing that an immortal, perfect, divine, limitless, indirect fractal of God wants is experience because it's immortal. It wants this experience, that experience, human experience, alien experience, 21st century experience, 38th century experience. And by the way, they're all happening right now. So it just wants experience, right? And through the experiences, it learns and evolves. And what it learns and evolves is about itself, this unlimited, divine, indirect fractal of God. So we are having this experience because the lower frequencies of the physical universe, which is where we're at, we're in the third frequency, not the third dimension. We're in the third frequency of the physical universe. We can actually experience physicality, solidity, and therefore a sense of limitation. So what does a limitless being want to experience? Limitation. What's that like? What's it like to be limited, to not be connected to everything all at once, which is our natural state? What's it like to be disconnected? That would be a fascinating experience. Sign me up for that because that's interesting. Death, there's no such thing as death, but what would it be like to actually think that you're going to die, that you don't exist after that? Again, it's an experience of limitation because an immortal, limitless being does want to experience everything. And some of those things that it wants to experience, believe it or not, are what you and I call limitations. Now, that's one of the reasons. I won't go on and on and on. It's one way that I, one way that I answer that. But the, the counter to that is that when we work with ourselves optimally, we can actually transcend those limitations even, even when we're here. And if you want to call those that state of being enlightenment or self-mastery, that's fine. But we can rediscover our connectivity to our own higher self and really to everything within the greater reality, even when you're here. And the growth comes from when things are most difficult. And nothing is more difficult than a physical incarnation into the lower frequencies of the physical universe. So this is as challenging as it gets. Now, we also do that because the reward is greatest. And I'll give uh, I'll give a silly analogy. And that silly analogy is we've all watched um, diving, like Olympic diving off the board, right? Now, if someone does a swan dive, right? And they do it flawlessly, right? They don't get a 10 because that dive is too easy. That's an eight, maybe an 8.5 because it was perfect, but it's an easy dive. Then someone else gets up there and does a triple backwards, somersault, flip, et cetera, et cetera, right? And they do a really good job with that. It's not perfect, but they do a really good job with that. That's a 9.5, maybe even a 10, degree of difficulty. Now, what it is that the this immortal self is after, which is an indirect fractal of God, which is the same thing what God is after, is its own evolution, its own self-understanding. Now, the opportunity to learn more about yourself happens when things are most difficult by doing the triple backwards somersault, et cetera, et cetera. This incarnation as a human being in this specific timeline is about as difficult as it's ever going to get, I promise you. So what that means is there's the opportunity for our love and wisdom to deepen and accrue through the difficulties that we, that we face when we're incarnate within the low frequencies of the physical universe. So we kind of put those two things together and we start to understand part of why we're even here. You opened up a whole box of incredible questions to ask you. I won't go on for hours, but you also talk about how to never reincarnate again. And many people I'm sure ask you this, I don't want to be here. Why did I come here? How do you not reincarnate again? Mm, okay. That's another really good question. Okay. Uh, I'll answer that. Okay. Let's, let's look at karma. Okay. Cause I think that's something that's really misunderstood or it's a term that's used very loosely, maybe without, uh, uh, certainly a tangible or specific understanding of what it actually is. Okay, so uh, second really silly analogy, think of Spider-Man shooting his spider web to, to whatever. And now Spider-Man is now stuck to whatever he shot his spider web to. Okay, so karma is the spider web. 
So it is whatever that we become attached or addicted to here, whatever that is, that prevents your own evolution and your own ascension. So if you're stuck and what you're stuck with is your own energy because you've become addicted or attached to a, a thing, a drug, uh, an experience, body, bodily sensations, wealth, uh, knowledge, whatever that you become attached and addicted to, you are now stuck to that. So you're not going anywhere. OK, so karma is really the glue that that keeps you from your consciousness evolving with the greatest efficacy. And therefore, you have to keep reincarnating because in that sense, energetically, through a lack of self-realization, you're now stuck here. You can only undo that attachment and addiction in the place that you got attached. You can't undo it in some other higher frequency or higher dimension. You're stuck here. Hence, this is part of the this from my perspective, this unnecessary need of a perpetual reincarnation tens of thousands of times with billions upon billions of parallel conditions and parallel lives. It's just not necessary from, again, from my perspective, it's just not. So learning how to never have to reincarnate again is simply through detachment. So through detachment, the spider webs are cut and that spider web, which is your energy, all your energy returns to you. And now you feel whole once again, because you have all of your energy with you. So detachment is actually power. And through detach, which is we're taught the opposite, right? Everything here is the opposite. So through detachment, you become powerful once again. You're no longer stuck to anything here. Now, once you have learned everything that you can possibly learn, and you're not stuck to anything here, there really is no need to come back. And what it is that you're really learning about is you. Now, if all your energy has returned to you, the only thing you're really going to be experiencing is yourself directly. You won't be experiencing beliefs, concepts, and identifications that you're using by being attached to them through your energy. So it greatly accelerates the, the, uh, the evolution of your consciousness, and therefore you're able to transcend the need to reincarnate. So that's the short, I could go on and on. That's the, that's the shortest answer of that. If you want to sever all attachments and addictions to anything, reclaim all your energy and keep experiencing and marinating within the self, self-realization. And then at a certain point, there's really nothing here that you need to experience that you would learn from. Mm -hmm. It's like graduating high school. I mean, once once you graduate, you don't say, hey, let me take eighth grade math again. You're not going to learn anything from that. And once you know yourself well enough and you're no longer attached to anything here, there really is nothing here for you. And this is one of the things that I teach in my more advanced class about how not to reincarnate again, because we're just not doing it again from my perspective. We're just not doing it again with the greatest efficacy. And I'm obsessed with efficacy in terms of the evolution of consciousness. And so is God. God is obsessed with the efficacy of its own evolution and the evolution of its creations. So this is how to work with yourself optimally. And one of the ways to not have to keep repeating human incarnations when it's simply not necessary. You, ex you explain it. Fantastically, thank you so much. I just want to touch on two things you said, which are part of some of my favorite subjects. And oh, gosh, I keep asking such big questions. I'm, I'm sorry. You spoke about uh, parallel lives, so I'm assuming that means multiple lives, so multiple parallel realities of Louisa. But you also sp spoke about multiple incarnations, whether it's in the past or in the future, that they're all happening now. So I guess that's two questions. <laughs> um, first, the parallel realities. Are there multiple, I'll give you an example, are there multiple versions of Louisa? Yes, uh, too many to count. Okay. Yeah, so so uh, now I'll first give uh, another silly analogy. I like silly analogies and they're, and they're helpful. Okay, so think of, think, of a, uh, think of a satellite radio. I don't know how many stations are available on a satellite radio, hundreds, maybe thousands. I don't, I don't really know, but lots and lots and lots of stations. Okay. Now, if you have a satellite radio, how many stations can you listen to at once? One, one at a time. Okay. But yet there are literally thousands of stations broadcasting music right now, right now, but you can only listen to one song at a time. Okay. Now our brain how our brain works in, in general, how our brain works is that it can only experience one reality at a time. Now, just like all those songs are playing concurrently right now, you can't listen to them and you can't experience them. You can only listen to one at a time. But yet 
all of creation, there's only one moment of creation seen from an infinite amount of perspectives. So that's really the, the easiest analogy to understand that everything is happening at once, just like all those songs are playing right now, but you can only listen to one at a time. So you can only, in general, experience one reality at a time. And that has to do with what the local environment that your body mind is attuned to and part of. So you're only going to experience our local environment or the 21st century of Earth. It's another way to look at that. But they're all, it's all happening right now. Okay. So that's a quick snapshot about what, what that kind of looks like. And there's much more detail than that, but that's the fastest way to say it. A parallel or a multiple life, a multiple Louisas uh, have to do when you make a choice. Okay. Existence is conscious, various levels of consciousness, but it's all God, source, creator. Okay. So anytime there's an opportunity for evolution, it's going to take place. So what that means is when we have a choice, right? Should I take this job or should I take that job? Or whatever, you can pick any kind of scenario that you like. Should I move to New York or should I move to California or whatever? So whenever there's a choice, that means there's energy behind both of those possibilities. Now, just like the radio, we can only experience one of those choices or one song, right? But yet, because there's energy behind that other choice, it actually comes to fruition. And that actually gets manifested or created. So there's a Louisa that lives over here and lives over here and married this guy and married this person and did this and did that. Now we can only experience just one version of Louisa, but every time there's a choice, a parallel condition is created because there's the opportunity for evolution within every one of those. It just so happens that our human mind or brain at this point within the low frequencies in this timeline, we can't experience the, the, the multitudinous, the concurrent and parallel versions of creativity that are happening simultaneously. Just like all those radios or all those songs are playing right now, how many can you listen to? One. But because everything is conscious, it's all God, it's evolving and learning. So every time you make a choice and you think that you went to California and you did, there's a version of you that also went to New York and to any other place that you were thinking about. And so one incarnation, one single incarnation is such a gift because upon a life review, we then review all of those things. We think that we just moved to California and, you know, got married and had two kids and, you know, died at 65 or, you know, whatever, whatever it is, right? No, that's one version of you, just one. One incarnation, you're going to have millions, millions of versions of you. And you're going to be able to review all that. And you are going to be the wisdom and the love that is retained from all of those experiences. The key is to bring that level of supreme intelligence into your life now by mastering being present and shutting down the egoic mind. Now, when you master being present, all that wisdom from all these different experiences that are happening right now becomes available to you. And it is fostered into you on the river of intuition, which is how you taste your own wisdom. But that only happens by being present. So by being present and mastering being present, we allow the supreme intelligence to enter into our life. That supreme intelligence is what we are. That's part of why it's so important to transcend the logic and linear, linear subconscious patterned egoic mind. I know that was very long, but that's part of why we want to do that because we will be guided in a way that we can't even fathom at this moment. No, that wasn't long. That was fantastic. <laughs> um, absolutely agree. I, I, I just love how you explained it. Just to touch on another big question, and I'm sorry, I, we could talk about the weather, but this is more exciting. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's cold. Um, <laughs> multiple reincarnations you spoke about before, whether it's, you know, 20, 36, whatever, it's all happening now, all when my physical body dies and I reincarnate, it's all happening now. Is that is that your belief? Uh, yeah, I would say it's not a belief. Uh, what I share is what I tangibly experience, so therefore it's a level of gnosis or self-knowledge. Uh, the key is to transcend beliefs. We use beliefs because we don't know. So what I speak about is what it is that I experience directly. What I teach is what it is that I experience directly. So yes, everything, here's an image if this is helpful, Louisa. Um, think of a rubber band ball, right? Okay. Think of each rubber band as a timeline. Okay. And they're all in the same space, right? 
and they're all intermingling, touching one another and affecting one another. Okay, it's one image of it. I don't, actually don't experience it quite like that. I experience it like bubbles when you were a kid and used to blow bubbles. That's actually how I experience it. And we shift our consciousness into each bubble based upon how we're vibrating and what it is that we desire to experience. When you really lose your mind, that's just what starts to happen. So uh, when you go above that, and when I say above, I mean frequentially or energetically. I don't mean physically because it's all the same space. So when I say you go above that, think in terms of raising frequency or raising vibration. So when you go above that, you can actually look down at the playing field of the rubber band ball or all those different bubbles, and you're simply outside of it. And all of it is taking place right now. And you simply choose where you want to insert yourself in terms of your incarnation. You could, after this, or, or me or anyone else, after this incarnation, Louisa, you could, you'll be removed from that. And then you could look at the, the 12th century and be like, you know, I want to go in there. Forget logic and linearity. It is such a reduction of what is. That's just the way our brain processes things. It's not the way things are at all, at all, right? So we can choose where we want to go and don't think in terms of, uh, oh, well, it has to be, you know, the, the 22nd century is the next incarnation. That has nothing to do with anything at all. We are this limitless, and we can do anything. We we really can. It's just the parameters and the limitations that we impose on ourselves. When those are removed, you realize that existence is a blank slate. You can create as you deem fit. And this is really what I really want to see for humanity is to take back that kind of power by ushering in what I call the wisdom that transcends knowledge. And hopefully that what I share as RJ and put into this realm, the teachings will long outlive my physical body and we'll be able to use these things ongoing and ongoing and ongoing because it will liberate us and free us not just from suffering mentally emotionally and physically but it will liberate us and free us from the confines of the egoic mind and therefore what it is that we're able to create and therefore experience well you're very very inspiring um just a last question on the linear linearity of time if time's not linear as we perceive it in our humanness and I understand I have multiple parallel realities of Louisa. Has my life is has my life already been planned? Has my life already occurred? In what we what would great, term as the future. What a great question. Okay, great question. And then we'll talk about the weather. No, I'm, I'm kidding. These are great, great questions. Um Yes. Okay. So when you say is my life planned? Yes, absolutely. And this is what's called a life plan. Okay, so let's let's go back to the rubber band ball, right? Okay, and so disincarnate, not embodied. You 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 quote unquote rise above that, and you kind of see the playing field, so to speak. Okay, now before you reincarnate or come back in, you make a plan based upon what it is that you want to experience, learn, and evolve from. That is the life plan. You make what's called soul contracts. We've probably all heard these terms. Who, you know, what what family you're going to incarnate into, the, the possibilities of who would be your life partner, or perhaps children, people that you're going to work with that you have this instant uh, rapport with. And you're mapping all of this out before you get here. The key is to align yourself with that. So you're working in unison with yourself and therefore the universe. But the, to answer your question, absolutely. Life plan is, uh, we all do it. You don't get to commandeer a physical vehicle without a worthy life plan. There's a long waiting list for, I promise, a long waiting list, a queue, if you will, to get a physical vehicle. And one of the things that you have to have is a worthy life plan. And when I say worthy, meaning that there is, it has been mapped out that there can be substantial evolution of your consciousness and therefore other people, other consciousness as well. It's really one consciousness. But if it's worthy, you get the blessing of getting getting a body. If it's not, you have to keep working on that to get something that is worthy for you to have even a physical vehicle. It's, it's, it's quite a hot commodity in the multiverse, I promise. So yes, we have a life plan. All of us do. Uh, and I'll let you know about mine for one second, just for one second. My last name is Spina, which means spine, right? And I became permanently paralyzed from the chest down. Oh, what a coincidence. I think not. I think not. This was planned. As when I used to say as a kid, if I ever get sick, I'll just heal myself. My last name is <laughs> means spine, right? So 
this is maybe more an obvious uh, tapping into the life plan, but we all do this. We all do this. You don't even get a body unless you have a worthy life plan. So incredibly interesting. I have to ask you when I when when I ask you about your beliefs, and this is what you know. Where do you receive your knowledge or your information from, or who from? Uh, well, it it would it would yeah it would make more sense if I said that I was getting downloads or I was communicating with my guide that now uh that's sort of true that's sort of true but the real truth is is that this uh information or knowledge or whatever is is me is my level of sentience i've simply removed the blockages which would be the egoic mind or the identifications to things and so what remains is what we really are so you could think of it as me channeling myself, my true self, or that supreme intelligence that we that we talked about earlier. So it, it's really me. And with that level of uh, awareness comes the ability to interact uh, with the greater reality and understand things. But really, this understanding is really what I really am. And our level of understanding, our sentience is what we really are. The supreme intelligence that we are is so unfathomable that we, we, we assume that we must be getting the information from, from somewhere else. It's, it's not true. We're it. And when you remove the blinders and remove the filters, when you remove the beliefs, the concepts and the ideologies, then what remains is this supreme intelligence. And it may look like it's a channeling or it may look like accessing, not really. I mean, it's all one thing. Channeling doesn't even exist. I mean, if you really looked at it deeply, I mean, who are you channeling? It's a different aspect of yourself. It's all one, right? So at a certain level, uh, it's it's really your own supreme intelligence that you're able to tap into when you remove all the blinders of beliefs, concepts, and, and identifications. That was great. Thanks for clarifying that. I've got two more questions, if if that's sure. okay with you. Sure. Um uh, not a huge one. What's what's your thoughts on angels and spirit guides? Well, angels, uh, okay. What people call uh, their guardian angels, okay? Uh, they're really guides and helpers. Angels are something completely different. Angels help maintain the, uh, the maintenance of uh the environment or the multiverse they help maintain it angels are not sitting on your shoulder and guiding you those are your guides and helpers and we all have them and on average we have between 12 and 15 every uh incarnate aspect or soul normally has about 12 to 15 it can differ uh but they're real they're with you they're often with, with i mean they're with you 24 7 they're often with you over a from a linear perspective, they're with you for sort of long periods of time because they are helping you because they may be an expert in a certain field. Now, most of them have not incarnated for the most part, but they may be experts in certain fields. Like people have a, a guide or a helper for their career, for their relationships, for travel, for health. Maybe they have a very specific goal within this incarnation and they're gonna be working with, I don't know, mathematics. They'll have a guide and helper that's helping them uncover and reach these uh, uh, conclusions uh, in mathematics. So guides and helpers are with us 24-7, literally. Uh, and they're often with us for multiple, multiple, multiple incarna incarnations. Angels don't operate that way. They have a completely different role or function. And that is to make sure that the uh, reality looks the way that it looks, that things seem to flow without major hiccups in the matrix. They help simply maintain the the functionality and the structure of the multiverse itself. Thank you. And my my final question, I, you probably get this a lot. Many many people are afraid of dying. What what happens when our physical body dies? Mm, okay, okay. There is no there is no death. Very important to understand. There is no death. It's just a change in scenery change in frequency, change in dimension. 
There is no death. There is no such thing. The only death we actually experience is when we're disconnected from our true self. That's that's the only real death. So once, once the incarnation is over, we no longer need this because the body is attuned to and part of the local environment. Once you've completed your life plan, you no longer need it, which is why the body stays here. So what you really are, your sentience that has commanded and been given energy, like we were talking about before, simply just leaves the body and then we'll go to where it needs to go to, to sort of recuperate, understand that it, uh, that incarnation is now over. It starts to reacclimate itself to its normal environment, believe it or not. So there's, there's no such, I mean, there's so much to talk about in regards to that, to try to sum that up. But the, the most important thing to understand is that there is no such thing as death. No such thing as death. As we said earlier, physical death is astral rebirth. Astral death is physical rebirth. From my perspective, the key is to transcend both of those limitations by letting go of the identity to both of those temporary forms. That's that's real self-mastery. And then you kind of come and go as you please at that point. But there's no such thing as death. And if we started to meditate, from my perspective, properly, and we're able to literally leave our body, first off, you're going to feel like a million bucks. I promise. Absolutely promise. You won't have this thing, this garment that we're wearing that's all low frequency. It's like getting rid of some, some clothing that just you've outgrown. It's just time to get rid of that clothing. You're going to feel much better. I promise. I've been doing this since I was a kid, leaving my body, leaving my body, leaving my body. Totally normal. Not just me. It's just totally normal. There is, there is no death. It's a change in scenery. It's a change in consciousness. It's a change in self-understanding. It's a change in what it is that you're able to experience just through intention. It's liberation. The key is to experience that level of liberation while you're still temporarily merged with the physical vehicle to feel that liberated and that free and that light even while you're here. But there's absolutely nothing to fear. That's the unawakened mind. And we keep imagining worst case scenarios for ourselves. Try imagining that everything works out great. If you fear death, try imagining that everything works out great. Try doing that with your life. Instead of imagining worst case <laughs> scenarios and torturing yourself with your own imagination, imagine if everything works out. Yeah. Right? Just say to yourself, how could this get any better? Let the universe show you. Is there anything I haven't asked you, RJ, that you would like on a final note to share with the Passion Harvest audience? Oh, well, uh, yeah, okay. And I, I, I may have said this in other interviews, um, but there, there is a lot of the experience of suffering is quite universal. And in fact, it's really the lower frequencies of the physical universe is really the only place that you can have that experience. But what I want everyone to know, not believe, know that what you really are is untouched by what happens to your body-mind. Okay, the body mind, the suit, right, is part of and attuned to the local environment. You are not the body mind. You are what's inside of it temporarily immersed within this biological space suit so you can experience physical reality. So no matter what is going on with the body mind, you are untouched forever, just like the sun. The sun is untouched by the weather. I don't care how much rain, how much snow, tornado, hurricane. I don't care for how long, hundreds of years. None of that weather touches the sun. And nothing here touches you. Ever. It cannot. It affects the body mind. Absolutely. I was paralyzed. It affects the body mind, but it doesn't touch you. So know at your core that you are totally fine completely unscathed, unharmed, no matter what goes on here. And the key is to have that kind of dominion, that knowingness, that dominion over your body-mind. And then no matter what is going on here, you don't even have the suffering of the body-mind. You've transcended that through your own self-realization. Great way to live. I'm going to try and to put it in practice more and more and what a wonderful message for the world that you're spreading. RJ, thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. Really, really, you're an inspiration. So thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been my pleasure. Thank my you very pleasure. much. My pleasure. Okay. Bye-bye.
please do subscribe for weekly passionate inspirational interviews.